The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. You know, art history is so important to us, and we don't always understand the lineage of art and how things came about. There was a period of time when Catherine the Great was trying to make Russia one of the great art centers of the world, so she imported the great masters from, mostly from France, to teach the artist in Russia. Russia then developed its own academy called the Russian Art Academy, actually the Imperial Academy, and they set up uh, one in St. Petersburg, the capital at the time, and then later one in Moscow. The one in St. Petersburg is called the Repin Institute, named after one of its students originally, Ilya Repin. Well, Repin and his students have changed the world of art because of their style. The people who teach today and the people who have taught at the Repin Institute are considered the very finest. That's considered the finest or certainly one of the finest art schools in the world. One of those people was Nikolai Wachin, the great Russian master who used to teach for many, many years at the Russian Institute. Now, Wachin is a master who sells his work for many, many mega dollars and has massive collectors all around the world. His work is so sought after and so desirable. And we went to him and said, we want to document your process of painting. And this is what you're going to see a little bit of today. This is a brand new video release, and it's called Master, Russian Master Portraits. Now keep in mind that Blachin is a Russian. He doesn't speak much English. We have a little bit of a translator on here, but most of this is just observation. If you watch how he paints, and then you paint along or you replicate it, you're going to see a massive increase in your own style. Well, enjoy this. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. Many years ago, I had an opportunity to meet Nikolai Blokhin in his studio in St. Petersburg, and it was such a wonderful experience, I wanted to share that with you. So we came here to Russia today to give you an opportunity to see this man work. It's a rare opportunity. You're going to love it. Готовы, да? Здравствуйте, меня зовут Николай Блохин. Добро пожаловать в мою студию. Hello, my name is Nikolai Blokhin. Welcome to my studio in uh, St. Petersburg on Vasilevsky Island. С натуры. Постановка, ну, достаточно такая, ну, достаточно такой 
Сюжет, ну, можно не то, что часто, но он бывает. Today I am going to be working on a portrait. This uh, genre is quite uh, well known in classical art. It's a uh, harlequin. Um, and my model is my old friend, whom I have known for... Nikolai Vasilievich, whom I have known for about 20 years. He has been um, a model for the students at the Arts Academy. Только что увидела, когда его знаешь, ну, как это допол дополнительная мотивация какая-то существует. Вот, ну. And it's very pleasant and nice to be working with uh, someone you actually personally know. The usual process. When I like the way the model is positioned, the composition, everything, I I end up taking a bigger canvas. Ну, постановка модели обуславливается. So uh, the setting of the model um, is a uh, uh, lengthy process uh, sometimes uh, because you have to get the light right um, and um, this time I think it has worked out uh, pretty well and it did not take too much time um, and uh, I think I have created a convincing um, uh, the pose the model the way that is convincing to me so I I am trying to create an equally convincing image on the canvas. I do not put a specific paints out for the job. Because oil paints do not dry quickly, so I just put them all on the palette and then in the process of my work I decide which paints I'm going to use for each certain work. I use uh, locally produced paints by our St. Petersburg uh, um, paint factory. Um, and uh, th this is pretty much how I work um, anywhere in the world. It's, it's not of a principal um, importance to me what paints to use, just oil paints. So there are uh, eight or nine uh, base paints that I use more in my work than others, and they are the Van Dyke Brown, Mars Brown, Ultramarine light, um, Madder Lake red, sap green, cobalt violet, raw sienna, and yellow ochre. Какие-то дополнительные цвета тоже входят. Ну вот, в принципе, вот основные там там восемь, девять каких-то крас. Those are my main colors, and the the ones that I use for blending, and sometimes for every specific job I can add uh, specific tints. Ну, как правило, я делаю эскиз, но здесь, как бы уже некая подготовительная работа прошла. Okay, um, so this time uh, the composition has already been formed in my head uh, because while I was positioning the model, I was trying different canvas sizes and uh, that I finally picked the one that I'm going to use. Uh, so I, I have the image in my mind of how I want this. Sometimes I make preliminary sketches, but this time I don't need it. Um, I already have the image, the view in my mind, how I want to do it, um, because I have enough experience. Um, some people, they want, they sort of uh, have to frame it for themselves. I don't need to do that. Um, I think the, the composition is very um, working very well this time. I'm going to just uh, uh, create a quick um, sketch with charcoal, but not detail, just an outline basically. And uh, as soon as I'm happy with it, I'm going to start with the paint.
Такова се чемърт на миня взгляд. А? Темные, как правило, в масляной живописи пишутся э, прозрачно. Ну, во всяком случае, более прозрачно, чем свет. Свет можно нагружать, свет можно, как бы, в светлой части лица можно, э, как бы, выискать. Because this is a dark background, I would start with the darker colors, and in, uh, in, um... Свет берется гладко, менее корпусно, чем светлый. Поэтому я начну с темных, начну с тени на лице и с... Painting darker colors are typically more translucent. I guess they're lighter, more transparent than the, the lighter colors. So I will start with the darker colors and the face, and uh, then I will go from that. Масло разбавитель тройник называется, а здесь просто разбавитель. It's a, a lacquer that varnish. is varnish. Varnish, yeah. Varnish uh, to uh, to uh, paint thinner and uh, turpentine. Turpentine. If that oil. Oil, masla. And and oil.
А, пальцем? Ну, как касание, я просто... Очень важно в живописи касание, вот темного тени. It's very important in painting, uh, the, the place where the shadow touches the light. So uh, I'm just making sure there are no gaps. And it doesn't always have to be done with a finger. Sometimes you can do it with a brush. I improvise. Иногда тряпкой, иногда мастихином, ну как-то вот все что. Most of the time, you know, artists work with brushes, but uh, sometimes I can use my finger, or sometimes I can use a cloth or whatever is handy um, to do this. Ну в основном, конечно, художники ими работают. Вот как там шапку рисую. So now I'm creating the hat, painting the hat. Вот, ну, когда начинаешь, ну, как бы, как правило, когда начинаешь холст, я, во всяком случае, стараюсь сразу его весь, ну, как бы, свое первое впечатление, чтобы не растерять, как бы, максимально быстро его весь, ну, как бы, прокрасить, взять основные большие отношения. So, when I start working with the canvas, I try to put my first impression and fill the canvas uh, with uh, um, the idea of uh, the painting as fast as possible because later things may shift, uh, light may change, the model may shift a little. So I'm trying to cover the canvas as quickly as possible so that later I can start working on specific details and areas.
Да пока я просто вот то, что я говорил. So uh, for now I'm just uh, basically putting the first uh, paint uh, on the canvas um, and as I mentioned earlier. Часа полтора сидим неподвижно, Николай Васильевич. Давайте перерыв делаем. Вот. I took these brushes because I want to cover the uh, the main area of the portrait. The, so I'm using the, the big brushes.
просто у каждой, ну как у музыки, есть какая-то определенная там, тональность, которая создана э, там, произведение. Также и в, в картине есть колорит, то есть определенное какое-то вот, ну, соединение каких-то. So just like in music, uh, where each uh, musical piece uh, is in a certain key, um, it's the same with art. There is a For each piece of work, there is a certain combination of colors uh, that I use, and um, uh, quite often, uh, even into the lighter colors, uh, there is a, a blending of adjacent colors uh, that uh, you have to use to create harmony. And um, uh, of course, you cannot overdo it, then, uh, not to make it look dirty. Uh, but when you ha have uh, enough experience, you know how much uh, of each color to use to to uh, sort of unite all the colors on the painting. Я пока это все уточняю, но и там достаточно. So, um, Uh, so, um, because this, the forehead is uh, the lightest uh, part of the, the portrait, um, I need to find uh, the correct uh, way of um, joining the colors. Ну, контраст, да, ну, как бы граница, ну, вот в данном случае, да. There are no certain rules, um, you have to portray the, the feeling of the, the painting, but uh, in this particular case, yes, this uh, place is the place of the highest contrast, so that's why it's the sharpest edge.
смотрю. Ну, это один из самых главных как бы, элементов лица, и они должны быть... Uh, so the, the What I aim at every time, I have to make it look like the person is, is really looking at me. It's not always um, highly detailed, uh, but it just has to look real. I have to create that feeling that the person is really looking at you. Да нет, я бы не, не сказал, но есть а, одно из а, правил обучения, одна из составляющих обучения, это... So, um, what, there is a universal exercise, when you learning to paint, you find the work of a master, um, whose work seems convincing to you процессе вот исполнения вот этих and if you if you like for example the way the eyes are on that painting you copy and you copy until you get as close to it as as it makes you happy uh, and uh, and then as you practice and practice and practice you gain your own skill and it varies for every single person there is no universal rule on how to do this. Everybody does it in their own way. After years of waiting, the Western world can now witness how the Russians paint their masterpieces. You'll discover the closely held knowledge and techniques that the 18th century masters have handed down through the generations. These Russian Impressionism methods were only taught by someone who had received direct training, but were never documented, limiting the number of artists who had exposure to this timeless information. Russian Master Portraits with artist Nikolai Blakin is the first time this Russian master has been recorded on video, showcasing everything you need to know to apply these age-old traditions in your own work. The Russians were famous for their style of Impressionism, thick paint, tremendous expression, and creating work that evoked powerful emotion. There's also a certain exactness to their work, the creation of form and the feeling of the subject. Blockin's paintings have sold for a half a million dollars or more and are collected by top collectors worldwide. Now, you have the rare chance to absorb the techniques from Nikolai himself in this video. Today, I'm going to be working on a portrait this uh, genre is quite uh, well known in classical art. It's a uh, harlequin. Uh, I use uh, locally produced paints by our St. Petersburg uh, um, paint factory. Um, and uh, th this is pretty much how I work um, anywhere in the world. It's, it's not of a principle. Um, importance to me what paints to use, just oil paints. While there is much that is traditional, there's so much that takes you beyond the brush. Finger painting, applying paint with a spatula, scratching into the paint, gooey tendrils, calligraphic marks and thick lobs. You'll experience Nikolai's amazing workspace, including the coming and going of his studio cat. And you'll see Nikolai get a physical workout as he paints on the large canvas. You'll feel as though you're with Nikolai in his studio as he sorts through piles of paint tubes and searches his vast collection of brushes for just the right one. As you watch and learn, you'll feel so close to Nikolai and his work that you'll want to have the final painting for yourself, even just to revel in this feeling forever. Available on DVD and instant video, order Russian Master Portraits with Nikolai Blakin today.
Well, that was Nikolai Volkhin, a piece of Russian master portraits. And it's a brand new video, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Keep in mind, this is a brand new release. We have a very special discount for you today only, and it's in the comments section. Make sure that you look for that. Now, here's our interview with Nikolai Blochin. Welcome to Interviews with the Artist. I'm Eric Rhodes from Fine Art Commissar Magazine. Today we're in St. Petersburg, Russia. What a wonderful treat it is to be in the studio of Nikolai Plokhin. Nikolai, welcome. We, uh, we want to learn more about you and about your career in art, but also the Russian academic system. Welcome to my studio. I'll be happy to answer your questions and give you my thoughts. So, uh, you've become a world-renowned artist. You've become very famous across the world, but it all started somewhere. Uh, where did you begin as an artist? What were your first memories of interest in art? Well, it all began very trivially. As a child, I went to different art schools and tried several of them until the age of uh, 13, when I finally found a school that I liked. And then, after that school, I went into a more serious and professional school, and I guess I can say that I smelled the paint and understood that it is mine. Uh, I've heard about, I, I actually visited a school in Moscow where there were young kids who were painting and drawing from life. Mm -hmm. Was this the kind of school that you went to as a young man? Uh, yes, there is a similar school in St. Petersburg as well. And that is how I started in the art school at the Repin Academy. Now, the Repin Academy is, is, uh, has very high standards. They only take a very small percentage of the people that come into the school, so you must have been pretty accomplished by the time you, you applied. Yes, it was not easy to get in in the first place, but nevertheless, once you get in, you still have to prove yourself and further advance. So let's talk about the Russian academic system. The, uh, most people in America are not familiar with how stringent the system is and the training process. Can you tell us a little bit about the training process? You, you were a teacher later. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, help us understand what the program is like, starting from the beginning? So, it's six years in total. For five years, you basically draw and paint for seven hours a day, six days a week. Every single day you draw, paint, and then the six year is the qualification year where you do the diploma work, which is typically a large painting. So what is the beginning of the drawing process? Do they start them out with cast drawing, uh, or what, what is the process from which piece to the next piece? At the academy? Yes. So, the first year of studies, you study the human head, the skull, the muscles, the facial expressions. To give you an example, during the first year, one of the works we had to do was draw a face from three different perspectives. A front view, side view, and three quarters. The second year, you move down and start drawing the torso in addition to the head. So including more body parts into the picture and studying. 
третьем курсе, например, есть задание фигура человека. In the third year, one of the tasks, for example, was to take the human figure, and we draw it with clothes and without clothes. The same person to study the irregularities, the laws of how the fabric folds on the human body. Вот такие закономерности. Вот потом задания усложняются ко всему к этому, потом есть. Then obviously the studies become more complex. They study more complicated matters. However, every year they still return to the basics of what they start with. They return to the portrait because it doesn't mean that in the first year, if you painted a portrait successfully, that you've created a masterpiece. A portrait is not a simple subject, and you can always advance your skills on that. What year do they begin painting? Both drawing and painting start in parallel from the very beginning. They do the same tasks sometimes. It all starts with the qualification exam in order to enter the academy. There are six works that you are supposed to produce. Three drawings and three paintings. A drawing and a painting of a portrait. A naked figure and a painting on a different subject. And also a free painting. So everyone has already accomplished a fairly high level of skill before they even apply to that school. So they, it's, it's, they're not beginning the process of teaching there. The process of beginning was in the school prior to the, the Repin Academy. Well, yes and no, because of course a lot of potential pupils that join the academy, they come and they possess certain levels of skill and certain levels of mastery. However, sometimes there may be some kids from the country that didn't have proper training, but the examination committee sees that they are gifted, and so there's a little bit of leeway there for the committee to give them a higher mark for one thing and maybe a lower mark for another. But basically what they're looking for is talent. So that raises the question, uh, there's always a debate about is talent something that is required? Is it natural that people who are gifted have this, or is it something that anyone can learn and, and aspire to? Uh, it's a very difficult question. I'm not really sure I have a straight answer for that. Because sometimes even a gifted person can sort of stop developing at a certain point and hit a brick wall. It depends on what kind of self-development a person undertakes, you know, what kind of books they read, what kind of culture they expose themselves to, and, you know, what have you. How many people apply to get into the Repin Academy, and how many are accepted? It's difficult to tell, because there are several stages in the qualification test. There are some that are not even admitted into the first level of testing. I would say that maybe out of two or three hundred people, a quarter of them are admitted into the exams. And out of that, I would say probably there are ten people for each placement making the attempt to get into the academy. And how many placements are there? In a new in a new start, how many students would start in the beginning year? There are four different departments that we have: painting, graphics, culture, and art history. And there's also the distance studies. But if you don't include those, I would say probably around 130 to 140 people. Okay, all right. Can you talk about the foundation of the Art Academy, uh, how it began, 
and what some of the history of the Academy is. So, Catherine the Great, the Russian Empress, she founded the Academy. I don't want to make a mistake, but it's somewhere around 1760-something. She, of course, because there was no history of academic art school in Russia, she brought in the teachers from France at first, and when we became not so friendly with France, she started inviting artists from Germany and Poland. And then little by little, our Russian artists picked up and we produced some local teachers. But until then, yes, it was all based on European academic school. Еще вот тоже дополню, очень важно, что Санкт-Петербург тогда был столицей России, и очень важно, что Академия художеств, она... I would also like to mention something that I think is very important. At the time the Academy was founded, St. Petersburg was the capital of Russia, so the building where the Academy is located was built then, and it was the collaboration of two architects, one foreign and one Russian. Предопределена... And it's such a magnificent building, and the location is amazing as well, because it's on the Neva embankment next to these famous statues. So when you see it, it causes you to feel almost in awe of the building. And when I saw it for the first time, I was amazed by the scale of the building, by its beauty. And I've always thought that when you see so much beauty on the outside, when you go inside, this beauty will appear inside of you and find a way to express itself later. So the Academy expanded eventually two other cities, right? The, the Academy has the Serkov in, in Moscow, and is there one also in another part of the country, or is it just the two? A hundred years after the Repin Academy was founded, they founded the College of Painting and Sculpture in Moscow. A hundred years later, there was a that later became an academy of its own, and now it's the Surikov Institute. And at one point or the other, smaller schools and art colleges opened around the country. So I would say maybe 10 or 15 of them. But to this day, there are only three official affiliates. The main one is the Repin Academy in St. Petersburg, and then there's the one in Moscow and one in Krasnoyarsk. Today, is there a difference between what's being taught at the Repin and what's being taught at the Surikov? Is there a difference in approach or a difference in style? It's difficult to answer this question because art is not static. It's basically like a living organism. So I would say that development is more like a spiral. Something new comes up, and then they return to the traditional school. And the new elements, when they appear, some of them stay, and some of them die if they're not accepted by the people. Well, 
I would say the academic schools obviously will prevail and always keep to the traditions. But I would say that no, there is no principal difference between Moscow and the St. Petersburg schools. So that raises an interesting question, and that is that um, in, the, in the early 1900s, I think it was 1917 or 1919, the Armory Show in New York, where Impressionism was introduced, and then we saw, um, we saw a lot of the beginning of what we would call the modern art movement. And uh, the original modern artists were classically trained. Even Picasso was classically trained. But then the next generation of artists said, we, we don't need that training, we can just express ourselves. So the artists got completely away from training. Uh, what are your feelings about that? And do you feel that it's absolutely important for artists to have this foundation of academic training? I would say that starting from the 20th century, there's become a much larger number of artists in general. Maybe it's connected to economic development or some other factors contributed to it. But I would say that within the term artist, there appeared a lot of different specialties. And I would say for classic art, you do need academic training. I would compare art to music, because starting from the 20th century, there's been many different types of music. Before the 20th century, there was classical music. Starting from the 20th century, we have rock, we have pop music, and all those different genres. So I would say this is a similar situation with art. But, but the, in music, the foundation of all music, whether, whether it's classical or whether it's rock and roll, the foundation is that you have to learn the, the notes, you have to know the keyboard. You can't just go in and slam on the piano and call it music. It's not successful that way. Yet the equivalent is happening in art. Some people are just going in and slamming the keyboard without any knowledge of, of color or color relationships or form. They're just expressing themselves and throwing paint on canvas. I would not agree 100%, because yes, maybe with a musical instrument, you can not just come and play, but if you turn on the TV, you can see that there are a lot of people who sing, for example. And they have no idea how to sing properly, and they have no talent. There are very many people like that these days, and it's the same with art. And coming back to our discussion, I would say there are different types of art, and all of them have the right to exist, but they all have different goals. There are such things as just interior art. They don't aim very high. For example, when it comes to me personally, I would rather enjoy something that is of a higher class, a higher standard. I would say that the same thing applies to theater, because theater used to be classical, and then there appeared many modern branch-offs, and I would still, if I would go to the theater, I would go to enjoy a classical play and listen to music that I would consider to be more useful. There is a resurgence uh, in America of classical art. Uh, there uh, are many ateliers which are teaching young people to um, to study in the classic form. They're starting with bark drawings and then cast drawings and, and then going to the live model. It's encouraging because there's so many younger people embracing it because they've looked at perhaps the way they feel as the art of their parents or grandparents is, is no longer speaking to them. Uh, is there, in your opinion, a strong future for this? Of course there's a future for that, because mankind is not exactly inventing anything new. All the development goes along a spiral. 
all those forms have existed before. Starting from ancient Greece, and nothing is really new. It may become richer, wider, accept some new details, but the fundamentals of beauty will always stay the same. Beautiful music will always be beautiful music, as well as beautiful women, beautiful colors. If you hear a beautiful melody, you enjoy it. If you hear someone scraping with a knife on glass, obviously you will not enjoy it. Pretty color combinations will always bring you joy, and if they aren't, then your brain will get tired of them very quickly. So, that's why I think traditional will always have a future, because the fundamental base of art will always stay the same. You've done a, a fabulous job of bridging the two worlds, the classical world and the modern world, because your paintings feel very contemporary, very colorful. They fit into a, a, a modern setting, and yet they're rooted in the classics. You can see the beautiful form and the beautiful structure of the figures, and you can see the classical training in them, and yet they feel very much like they were painted today, not a hundred years ago. But the, but the sensibilities are of a hundred years ago, the, the, the structure, the form, the, the beauty of the drawing and the painting. Um, perhaps some of our viewers would be interested in knowing what you're thinking when you're creating a new painting. What is the process that you're going through in your mind? Let's say you've decided to do a, a portrait or a, a figure uh, are, are you trying to tell a story? What, what do you go through in your thought process when you first bring a model in? It's really very different for each case. Inspiration is very unpredictable. Sometimes I may have a dream about something and then paint it, and it may be easy. And some paintings, they take a long journey to arrive when I want them to. So there appears, for example, to be a whole series of paintings where I work on the same subject and there's just something I'm not happy about. But I would say the process is different each time. There's no one universal rule of inspiration. And uh, that which means, I assume, some paintings you work on for long periods of time over years, and some paintings just come quickly? It often depends on the size of the painting, obviously, and the scale. However, there's some that are faster than others. For example, if I buy a bouquet of flowers and I have to paint it, I know that tomorrow or the day after, the flowers will wilt and I have to work quickly. Or, if I start to paint a landscape, I know that in a couple hours from now, rain may start or the weather will change, and it won't look the same anymore. So, those paintings typically come faster. The larger works, however, they take longer and more than one attempt. So there are a lot of people who are watching this that will never have the opportunity to attend the Repin or the Serikov and might not even have the time or the money to be able to go to a, a good art school. What is your best recommendation for them if they have to study on their own? Is it possible? and what should they be doing? I would say, of course, you have to stay within the environment. You have to read books, you have to visit museums, you have to look at good paintings. And also, artistic people tend to stick together. It's like Eric, like you, for example. You organize these conferences where people can attend master classes, different workshops, and what have you. It's amazing. Also, I would recommend that maybe people display their art, because when you see it next to someone else's art, you can compare. You can develop yourself from that. Еще вот дополню, очень важно видеть это вживую, потому что вот сейчас часто 
телефончик там заменяет все. I would also say that it's very important to be in touch with live art because these days our mobile phones have replaced pretty much everything and it's just not the same. Вот когда ты его видишь и как как то же самое живое общение не никогда не заменит. For an artist, it's very, very important to see a painting live and to be able to admire it in real life. Художник в картина она тем и отличается, почему она и стоит там сто раз дороже, от чем она отличается. That is why a painting is always a hundred times more expensive, for example, than a photograph or some print, because it has its own unique soul. Собрание что ли художников? Они сейчас так. Мир так устроен, что этого ну, достаточно мало. I think it's very important for artists to gather under the same roof, because these days people have lost touch. Больше что ли интерес было к There's television, there's also all those different types of contemporary art that have appeared. And, for example, compared to the Soviet Union, I know that there used to be a lot more art exhibits taking place. And these today, they're not as widely organized. They're not as frequent as they used to be. So, I think, Eric, when you bring these artistic people together, it's very good for them, and it's a very important job that you are doing. With the magazines and the conferences and the symposiums. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for doing the interview today. This has been a pleasure. Thank you for having us in your studio. It's really fun to see where you work and, and, and to watch you work. Thank you. Well, this has been Interviews with the Artist, and our guest today has been Nikolai Blokin, and it's been wonderful to have an opportunity to see his environment. Thank you for watching. I'm Eric Rhodes with Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. Well, that was the great Russian master, Nikolai Blachin. I had the pleasure of spending five days with him in St. Petersburg, Russia, most recently. So what I'd like you to do now is to look it up. You can find out more about this entire video. I think we shot for five days his entire process. And you can get more on it at lilyartvideo.com. Keep in mind, also, there's a special discount code in the comments section. And thank you today for watching this great Russian master. After years of waiting, the Western world can now witness how the Russians paint their masterpieces. You'll discover the closely held knowledge and techniques that the 18th century masters have handed down through the generations. These Russian Impressionism methods were only taught by someone who had received direct training, but were never documented, limiting the number of artists who had exposure to this timeless information. Russian Master Portraits with artist Nikolai Blakhin is the first time this Russian master has been recorded on video, showcasing everything you need to know to apply these age-old traditions in your own work. The Russians were famous for their style of impressionism, thick paint, tremendous expression, and creating work that evoked powerful emotion. There's also a certain exactness to their work, the creation of form and the feeling of the subject. Blakhin's paintings have sold for a half a million dollars or more and are collected by top collectors worldwide. Now, you have the rare chance to absorb the techniques from Nikolai himself in this video. Today, I am going to be working on a portrait. This uh, genre is quite uh, well known in classical art. It's a uh, harlequin. I use uh, locally produced paints by our St. Petersburg uh, um, paint factory um, and uh, th this is pretty much how I work um, anywhere in the world. It's, it's not of a principal um, importance to me what paints to use, just oil paints. While there is much that is traditional, there's so much that takes you beyond the brush. Finger painting, applying paint with a spatula, scratching into the paint, gooey tendrils, calligraphic marks, and thick globs. 
you'll experience Nikolai's amazing workspace, including the coming and going of his studio cat. And you'll see Nikolai get a physical workout as he paints on the large canvas. You'll feel as though you're with Nikolai in his studio as he sorts through piles of paint tubes and searches his vast collection of brushes for just the right one. As you watch and learn, you'll feel so close to Nikolai and his work that you'll want to have the final painting for yourself, even just to revel in this feeling forever. Available on DVD and instant video, order Russian Master Portraits with Nikolai Blokhin today.